gentlemen, you are most welcome in the Township Society of Alexandria in one of the lectures of our cultural program, February, May 2023. Uh, today, the subject is very tempting, it's a very attractive one because anything related to underwater archaeology, or let's say archaeology underwater, is um, always it always has its um, uh, uh, inter has interest for everybody uh, uh, dealing with uh, heritage and archaeology and history and other things. Um, our lecturer today, you, we are very happy to welcome her because this is the first time for her to the Archaeological Society on the one hand, and the other, she is the uh, only up till now American to be enrolled in Alexandria University as a student of higher studies in the uh, Alexandria Center for uh, uh, Underwater uh, Heritage and Maritime Archaeology. Uh, Alicia Johnson. Uh, she has a master's degree in maritime archaeology from Alexandria University. Uh, um, Bachelor of Arts in Classics with a minor in Latin in the University of Cum Laude, uh, College of Charleston. Bachelor of Arts in History with minor in Jewish Studies, again, University of uh, Cum Laude, College of Charleston. Her experience is focused in uh, a nautical archaeology, so he is a member in the uh, Nautical Archaeological Society in UK and uh, in USA as well. Underwater photographer, dive master, and boat restorer. And um, before I give her uh, the mic, let me uh, uh, announce the very happy news about uh, our colleague and dear friend of the Archaeological Society, Ziad Morsi, who has got his PhD at last from Congratulations for Ziad and uh, hoping for everyone who is in this route to, to reach his targets. Um, the title of our lecture is Obstacles and Methods in the documentation of underwater cultural heritage and in, in, in my view, I don't know if I'm seeing well or not, if I do this title I will write methods and obstacles. But it seems that there is a point about the obstacles to come first before even the methods. So we are all ears and we are looking to listen to your lecture. Thank you very much. You're Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've done a speech here, since I've done a very opening in the Philippines. But my name is Alicia Johnson, and I wanted to say thank you to the Society and to everybody for attending my talk. Now, before we get going, let's go over our title here again. We're going to be looking at the obstacles and the methods of documenting underwater cultural heritage. Now, I'm sure you guys all know Egypt has some of the world's most beautiful cultural heritage sites, not only on the land, also underwater. As we have here the picture behind me, one of the most famous dive sites in the world, and one of my favorite shipwrecks is the Thistle Horn. And if you guys want to follow me on social media, I've got my names right there. So let's go ahead and dive on in. So I don't know if you guys know who this is, but this is Jacques Cousteau. He was one of the pioneers in developing the scuba industry as well as the equipment that we now use to be able to immerse ourselves in the water. And he's well known as being one of the first people to document and present the wonders of the underwater world to the public. And what he has said here is, we love what we marvel at and protect what we love. So first off, what is underwater cultural heritage? It's a little bit of a long word, needs a little work with marketing, but let's go ahead and discuss it. 
Underwater cultural heritage includes all the material evidence of human activities carried on in the marine environment, much of which is concentrated on the sea floor. And in this image here, we have a very famous ship that is called the Carnac, which to this day is a very popular dive site that people from all over the world want to come and see. So what types of underwater cultural heritage exist? Well, first off, we have the field of transport and communications, which includes shipping, ports and navigation, submarine cables, and military uses of the sea, focused on naval activities. Secondly, we have activities pertaining to the use of marine resources and disposal of waste into the marine environment, such as fisheries, agriculture, mineral and energy resource development, waste disposal, and related pollution issues. And lastly, we have the non-material human uses of the ocean and the coast, which can include leisure activities, such as scuba diving, marine research and education, as well as conservation. So what's important about underwater cultural heritage and why is it something that we should be considering preserving and promoting? Well, first off, money. Money is a very essential thing. And underwater cultural heritage is actually a driving component to the Egyptian tourism industry. Scooby diving tourism has the potential to be a sustainable source of income for Egypt. With nearly 44% of all people who visit, visit Egypt, they come solely for the purpose of snorkeling and scuba diving the Red Sea. And just this past year, Egypt was voted number two diving in the world by dive. Can everyone hear me? All right, good. I got a loud voice anyways. So Egypt was just voted number two diving in the world by Dive Magazine for the second year in a row. And social media allows for greater public engagement than ever before. Underwater photography, shipwrecks are always popular content, and you can see them trending on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, any social media platform that you'd like to look at. And right here, we have a, a group of divers that came just to Egypt to celebrate a wedding. They didn't want to do the traditional party, so they put all of their friends on a Red Sea dive boat. And I went with them for a week, and all we did was go and scuba dive and look at the beautiful sights that are in Egypt. So why should we preserve this stuff? Well, a main component of dive tourism, the shipwreck of the, of the Thistlehorn is connected with World War II. So it actually brings together multiple different, <laughs> different countries. You have German history involved, Egyptian history involved, as well as English history. So it's kind of the aspect that really brings together the cultural heritage, identity, and history of a multinational cooperation. And it is also a site that is photographically stunning, and it is also considered one of the most recognizable aspects of underwater cultural heritage that is known to divers. However, the number of inexperienced divers that are on this site has led to the site falling, not falling into disrepair, but there has been noticeable damage done to the ship in the last couple of years. So how can we document underwater cultural heritage? Surely there are traditional means such as journals, photography, and more recently we've developed a method called photogrammetry, as well as laser scanning, side, side scan sonar, as well as radar. And these are all methods that maritime archeologists and underwater scientists use to be able to identify, document, and study these sites. So first off, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with peer-reviewed articles. So what are the pros of peer-reviewed articles? As they are largely the most accessible aspect to what I would call conventional methods of research. Information has been thoroughly researched and corroborated by other researchers. Bibliographies provide additional resources on the given topic. It is easy to find multiple articles on relevant topics to expand research, and articles contain images, 
maps, and other sets of data which are relevant to underwater cultural heritage. As I said, it's also a standard of academic research. When you learn how to do research, one of the first things you are taught is how to access peer-reviewed journals as well as their articles. And the digitization and the technological development in the last 20 years has enabled research to be more accessible than ever before. And you can access these sites via JSTOR, Elsevier, Scientific Direct, and multiple other avenues. And furthermore, it's easy to share downloaded PDFs with your peers, and you can send information back and forth faster than you ever have been able to before. But there's a downside. So Mark Twain is someone that I admire very much, and he made this statement about 160, 170 years ago that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. This is very important to consider because the limitations that are there within peer-reviewed articles. <coughs> articles are often behind a paywall and only accessible if your university pays a subscription. I'm sure many of you have wanted to read an article only to be greeted by the big block saying, please sign in with your university. This is a problem because the public does not have accessibility to this, which leads to the aspect that misinformation and disinformation is much cheaper to create and easier to distribute. So academics are fighting against misinformation which is being pumped out at a much faster rate and is more accessible to the public. Published mainly in English, which can be an issue if you are not an English speaker, or if you do not have excellent reading comprehension because the style of academic writing is difficult to read. So there's a limitation for many, uh, much of the Arabic speaking world because not a lot of journals and articles have been published in Arabic. So the issue of limitation of language is an issue that we are facing in the scientific community. And that's why people such as my friend Ziad over here are actively trying to make more accessibility via the languages and publications. Lastly, well not lastly, research and computer skills are necessary to be able to find articles on a topic. I know many people have an idea of how to use Google, but there are certain methods such as using quotation marks, asterisks, when you're trying to find a journal article that make it easier to find exactly what you're looking for. But if you have not had the training in how to properly find articles, it can be difficult, it can be overwhelming, and you often find yourself being redirected to misinformation and disinformation that might not have gone through the scrupulous and regimented form of peer-reviewed articles. And publishing articles is time-consuming and costly. So if you are a researcher and an academic, you're often faced with the steep cost of funding your research. Furthermore, journals often have a fee that you have to pay in order for your articles to be published, thus putting a limitation on the accessibility for not only the public, but researchers. So let's move on to the next one, one of my favorite ones. Pros of photography and videography. We have my good friend Simon here, he is one of the world's top photogrammetrists in the world. And images and videos can be self-published and hosted on a myriad of platforms for free, which include Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and more. Which means because they are hosted for free, greater accessibility to the public is there. They are not behind a paywall. You do not have to have your university credentials to be able to find <coughs> this information. And furthermore, it leads to a higher engagement levels for various audience types beyond academics. I'm sure many of you know, teenagers like to use social media. Older people like to use social media. We like to use social media. Not everybody is an academic and they might find their information elsewhere. So it's essential that as researchers, we understand the needs, the wants of the public if we wish them to be able to read our research. You can furthermore collect visual data and information of sites, artifacts, and conditions with, photo with photography. Although at this point, one of the limitations with photography is that you do not have the exact scale and you are limited to the perspective of the photographer when you take these photos. Also, you can create videos and photographs and this can be very rewarding artistically for an academic or creator. 
I love taking photographs. I love making videos. And that is a source of joy for me, seeing my work be recognized and enjoyed by the public. I feel fulfillment in doing this that I might not otherwise feel knowing my article that I spent months of my life on nobody is going to read. People will look at a photo. <laughs> Imagery can be understood, shared, and admired by the general population rather than restricted solely to academics. The equipment to start doing underwater photography is not as expensive as many of the other traditional methods that we might use in underwater cultural heritage and documentation. You can start off with just a GoPro. You can start with GoPro 4, something that's 15 years old, and you can still capture a good image underwater for not so much money. Furthermore, with GoPros and other cameras, we're able to sync them together to be able to create 360 degree virtual tours for the public, which increases accessibility for people who might not, not, might not be able to visit the site. And also it's something that helps people who might be handicapped. It creates greater accessibility to be able to create 360 degree virtual tours, videos, and photographs. So what are the drawbacks to photography? Well, I can tell you as a photographer, no one ever gets a good photo of you. You can ask my friend Sienna here. <laughs> it can also be cost prohibitive. Although a GoPro is inexpensive, you run into the issue of higher end equipment costs significantly more. And replacing equipment, especially in Egypt, can be very difficult, time consuming, and frustrating, which means I take very good care of my equipment because if it disappears, I'm really screwed. <laughs> the programs to edit videos and photographs is also expensive. You're looking at a subscription from Adobe Creative Suite. I traditionally use Lightroom, Photoshop, and Premiere to be able to edit my videos and photos. And you're looking at a subscription rate of about $350 a year just to be able to have these programs. Furthermore, the perspective of a site that the audience member is able to get to receive is limited to what the photographer chose to show them. So the location is limited, the perspective is limited, and also scale can be offset because if you warp a photo trying to get the um, optics to look correct, you might be deteriorating the exact measurements that you are taking. So photographs, although they are eye-catching, they can be misleading when being used for academic research. Artistic capability is a skill set which takes years of practice and experience to master. And this is one of the good things though about our generation and the younger people is that we all have a camera in our hands. So we all kind of grow up with this idea of how to frame a photo, the composition and whatnot. So the new generation and onwards has a little bit higher capacity than maybe some of the older generation who learned more traditional methods. And without experience, Few people really understand the amount of time and effort it takes to make quality images and videos. If, for a two to three minute video, I can spend anywhere from six to 12 hours editing this for someone to enjoy for two minutes. So it is quite time consuming. Furthermore, a big issue I run into in Egypt is the internet. I know we all struggle with the internet and the upload speeds. When you create a video that's in 4K, it's usually anywhere between 400 megabytes and two gigs. And trying to upload on one megabit per second is very frustrating. So it's a big issue being able to publish your work. So if you shoot high quality content, you're faced with the obstacle of fighting the infrastructure that needs continued development, which only leads you to learning a new skill of how to compress your videos to be able to make them as accessible as possible. So I consider that an obstacle, but at the same time, helps you develop a little bit of critical thinking with problems. <clears throat> so here we have a couple of my photos that I've taken over the years here in Egypt. This here is the thistle gorm, as I showed you earlier. And this right here is how we would document an archeological artifact underwater. On the Rex at Risk project, we were going through the thistle gorm and looking at the change that had happened since they were last on the wreck in 2017. What we use here is a traditional, met uh, traditional method of a measurement bar, which put up against this beautiful radiator here, 
you can kind of get an idea of just how big <coughs> this item is. But as I said, the perspective is limited. Right here is the beautiful Dun Raven. This is a site that's actually accessible to pretty much anyone that has an open water certificate. This is a site that is very popular with divers from all over the world, and I would call it a beginner's dive because you don't need to penetrate this site to be able to enjoy it. You can just dive over it and you can see all of the beauty of this shipwreck that went down in the late 19th century. Right here is another image of the Thistlegorm with one of the locomotives that's on top. And this particular image has been shot by many different people and it's very recognizable. <coughs> this is the bow of the Thistlegorm. She's beautiful. And furthermore, what I think the most important thing about photography is that an image is worth a thousand words. I can sit down and write an article about the deterioration of the Carnatic in 2022. I could write 20 pages about climate change, pollution issues, irresponsible divers, or I can show you a picture. What do you guys think is more effective? Do you guys think the photograph that shows the corals dying versus where it is now? Simply put, I can convey a message without ever having to write anything to the general public. Other methods of documenting in the past was digital rendering and also with just a pen and pencil. My good friend Mahmoud Said, he drew this for me. This is the Carnatic. But as you guys can see, it's a little limited in how it can be used for academic research. <coughs> it works great with presenting the content, but it can't necessarily be used for collecting data. It's a good presentation of what does the wreck look like. So moving ahead onto the next method of documentation, we have something that's called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is the process of taking thousands of photos of a site that loosely overlap, thank you so much, and using a computer program to be able to create cloud points from all of the photographs that pick out the same common <coughs> data points, connect them together, and are able to create a beautiful 3D model like this. This was done by my good friend Simon Brown for our most recent Rex at Risk project. Now here is a video, a flyover of the photogrammetry. Now as you guys can see, there's a lot more detail than was in my friend Mahmoud's drawing. And this can be used by researchers to be able to accurately figure out scale, distance, measurements, all of this good stuff. Photogrammetry is not only an art form, but it is a scientific method of documentation that can be used by anyone at any point in time if they have access to the 3D models. So photogrammetry is the science and technology of obtaining reliable information about the physical objects in the environment. Through the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images and patterns of electromagnetic, radiant imagery, and other phenomena. Right here we have the Thistlebore. And this is a beautiful model that took a significant amount of time to create. And Simon Brown actually won Scientific Diver of the Year award because of his work on the Thistle board. So let, what are the pros of photogrammetry? So before I discuss that, there's a nice little video here of me playing. This is how we document photogrammetry. As you guys can see here, I'm taking a lot of photos, you see the flashes, and what I'm doing in this point is I'm measuring the distance between each photograph with my fin kicks. So I do one, two, click. One, two, click. And in that process, I'm able to capture a significant amount of photographs that have a common shared point of reference for each point that will be put into the point cloud. It creates excellent data collection method, which captures precise scale and details. 3D models allow for a realistic and artistic rendering of a site, which can be navigated digitally. Sites such as Sketchfab allow 3D models to be hosted and they are accessible to the public. You can go on sketchfab.com and look at anybody's model 
that they put up there. It's highly accessible and it's a great reference point for researchers and anyone that's interested in these sites. Three models enable researchers to be able to access a site virtually, meaning you don't ever have to go to the site to be able to take the measurements, to figure out the scale, to notice a little discrepancy with one area, some damage to the other. And furthermore, as I said, with people who face any handicap, this allows sites to be accessible to them that might not ever have been before. Multiple models can also be created of the same location over a period of time to evaluate and compare deterioration or other issues that are affecting the site. With the Thistleborn project, we were able to create a model in 2017 and a model in 2022. And we are overlaying those two to see which items have been stolen, what has been moved, which areas are facing um, decomposition or corrosion. So overall, having multiple models made of the same location allows for more comparison to be made better than the human eye would ever be able to match. Data collected can be used to compare with pre-existing archives and records about the ships and sites. Because a lot of these ships that went down, they have records in history from their point of departure and their point of arrival, saying what they had on the boat, who was on the boat, where was the boat going. So you can use access to historical records in tandem with photogrammetry to be able to learn more about the sites. And methods of creating 3D models, they are effective and engaging um, to the public to be able to present data, which unlike photography, allows people to choose their viewpoint of the subject rather than the perspective of a photographer. If you go on Sketchfab and you look at any of these models, you can click on the model and you can zoom in and navigate it from any point you want, which creates greater accessibility to a site than photography and videography can. So this is a more traditional method of a digital rendering of the thistleborn. If you're a diver, it's not a bad site. Basically, we have a site map here, which says, all right, we're gonna go down, we're gonna go up to the stern, we're gonna come around, ride that car, and have a great time. So this is a great way to show divers who are going on the site and to give the average person an idea of what the shipwreck might look like. Now let's compare that to what a photogrammetric model looks like. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? That's beautiful. That's art right there, guys. But as you guys can see, there's much more detail accessible with a photogrammetric model. Now this is a flyover rendered video. So if you go on the Thistlegorn project, you can go in and you can dive inside every portion of this wreck. You're not limited to what photography and videography shows you. And furthermore, with photogrammetry, as long as it is done correctly, you have the appropriate scale, which means if you're a researcher and you want to know what is the length of the, of the anti-aircraft guns, you can get that information just by going to the 3D model. So let's talk about the downsides to photogrammetry. It is expensive. There's a high cost. You are talking underwater cameras and strobes. You need those programs like Metashape or Zephyr. You need training for these courses for the programs to be able to use the program. And you also need to be a decent diver with good buoyancy. This is a lot that you need to have in order to be able to create a decent photogrammetric model. The processing hardware also requires a high-end gaming PC that you're looking at anywhere from three to $7,000 to be able to run the program to make a model like the Thistlegorm. So this is a very cost prohibitive, I was gonna say, you're, you're nodding, you know exactly what I'm talking about, it's expensive. So furthermore, multiple dives are also needed with multiple people to be able to create the 3D model for a large site. And if you're working on a large site like the Thistlegorm, what's useful is something called scuba scooters. They're a lot of fun, but they're also used in science. But here in Egypt, there are some issues with being able to have access to a scuba scooter. They're not always easy to get. You might not even be allowed to use it, and it's going to be expensive. Also, the data sets you create 
from capturing all of these photos, every photo has a size. If you shoot in RAW, each photo can be about 25 megabits. If you shoot in JPEG, you're looking at about three to six megs. Now, say you have 4,000 photos, that's a very large data set, which means you need to have the hardware to store this data and also to be able to upload it to the site. And also, it is just very time consuming to be able to stitch all of these together. The data sets are large and the processing time, as well as uploading large files. One week of the rec set risk, we created 30 gigs of photos. And that wasn't video, that was just the photos that we used to be able to create the recs. It requires a disciplined and methodological approach to collect the data in order for them to be able to line up in the programs. With photogrammetry, you are trying to create photos that loosely overlap, which means that you need to create a method of capturing the site. So you want to basically kind of, you can't, you can't zigzag around. It won't work. You need to follow a U shape going back and forth and being aware of everywhere that you're photographing and ensuring that your photos all have a loose overlap. Otherwise, the computer will not be able to find the common points to be able to stitch it together. And you will have a model that is lacking perspective that might not have a certain area and it doesn't come out looking as pretty and pristine if you were to use a more disciplined approach with your diving techniques. Data can also be low value for researchers unless it is scaled. And there's a lot of um, novice photogrammetrists who enjoy photogrammetry, but they don't necessarily <coughs> scale with the, with the models that they capture. So while you might be able to see the details of the site, you cannot get accurate measurements, which can be a huge hindrance. So it's important when creating photogrammetric models that you ensure that scale is appropriate and you are doing the correct methods to be able to ensure you can provide this to further, to further researchers. Moving on, we're gonna go on to something called laser scanning. So does anyone here know what REC this is? Anyone? I, I was gonna say there's a sweet Dion song about it. I'm pretty sure you guys all know that one. Well, this is the Titanic. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's the Titanic. And this was actually done a couple of years ago with a method called laser scanning. Now laser scanning is a new technology that is used mainly with terrestrial archaeology, but it's moving underwater, which is great. So LIDAR is light detection and ranging. It's a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of a pulsed laser to measure ranges, variable distances to the earth. LIDAR scanners allow for researchers to measure water depth map underwater terrain, and classify submerged in vegetation habitats. They're also used to study marine ecology, water quality, and the environmental impact of contaminant spills and the hydrodynamic elements of, an, of the environment. A LIDAR system calculates how long it takes for beams of light to hit an object or surface and reflect back to the laser. So basically, this device shoots out a green laser beam, and how long it takes to get back is how it's able to determine the depth, the distance, or the measurements. It's really cool. So it calculates how long the beams of light take to hit an object on or the surface and reflect back to the laser scanner. The distance is then calculated using the velocity of light, which is also known as the time of flight measurements. So here are all the different types of LIDAR. On the terrestrial, you have stationary and mobile. And you can have a handheld, you can have a land vehicle, or you can put it in a helicopter or an airplane. This is a very versatile new technology. With the marine and aquatic area, we have stationary, subsea, or airborne, in which you can be using a tripod, <coughs> an automated underwater vehicle, or a ship. And then you can be using, again, you can use a helicopter to be able to go from above and shoot down the laser. So what are the pros of laser scanning? LiDAR scanning can reach depths beyond the limit of a tech dive. Nobody's diving down to the Titanic. We need more technology to help us get there. It's highly accurate and there's less risk of human error. It's time efficient and on land you can cover 
a thousand square kilometers in just 12 hours and within 24 hours you can create elevation models of what you scanned so it's extremely time efficient you do not need multiple divers you do not need multiple dives you just need this machine and the know-how to do it a wider surface area compared to photography and photogrammetry St simply put you can cover more like more area with lidar than you can just with your legs. It delivers a fine scale of dimensional features in the present day conditions of a site without any need of physical interaction. Sites such as the Titanic, they are brittle, they are frail, and they are corroding. This is just a fact. So as of last year, I believe I read that a submarine crashed into the Titanic. That was a problem. But with using automated underwater vehicles and ROVs, you can go into delicate environments and you have very little risk of disturbing or damaging the site, which is a great thing if you're dealing with anything that's down deep or something that's delicate. It's applicable in delicate environments. However, it works well with poor visibility. If you cannot see it underwater because water conditions do change for divers, LIDAR gets rid of that issue because nothing. No, uh, no uh, the salinity and the particles of the water do not inhibit the laser when it's shooting out. Less risk as well because you do not need divers. You're basically putting a machine underwater. So there's less risk to the actual researchers themselves and to scientists. It is relatively inexpensive and it is reliable. And with all technology, the longer technology exists, the cheaper it gets over time and the more accessible it becomes. In light detection, the ranging is compatible with other surveying methods and imaging techniques. It can be used alongside sonar or radar systems to address its limitations and complement one another. The data generated by this technology can also be integrated with other data sets and sources for more in-depth analysis and comparison. A lot of this technology with documenting underwater cultural heritage you don't just use one method, you use multiple methods if you wish to create a, a strong and reliable source of research and data for other researchers, as well as being able to present it to the public. So what are the drawbacks? Well, it's got limited range for one. You've got about 532 nautical miles that the green laser can shoot. And it can also penetrate ocean waters up to about 300 meters which is better than photogrammetry, but it is still limited. There is also the issue of reflections. A notable disadvantage of LIDAR is that it does not work well in situations in which there are high sun angles or huge reflections from another light source. Sonar works best underwater because of the reflectivity limitations of light pulses. Data processing requirement is high because LIDAR can cover a wider surface area at a faster rate it tends to generate too much data, which if we're in Egypt and we're dealing with slow internet upload speeds, this is also an issue. Also, lasers cannot penetrate too well through thick vegetation. It cannot penetrate these obstructions, which unlike radio waves and microwaves. In an underwater environment, given the refractive index and water changes with temperature, pressure, and salinity, it is important to monitor these variables in parallel to improve the accuracy and depth measurements taken. And right here, we have an image of the TBD Devastator, which is found in the Marshall Islands. It's from World War II. And you can see here that we have the process of laser scanning this delicate site to be able to create a model from this. Moving on, multi-beam sonar. Uh, the model doesn't look as pretty as the other ones does, I guess. So multi-beam sonar is a type of active sonar system which is used to map the seafloor and detect objects in the water column or along the seafloor. The multiple physical sensors of the sonar are called a transducer ray. They send and receive sound pulses that map the seafloor to detect other objects. They are used to survey the search area in order to create an overall idea of the topography and the substrate that is present usually within 5 to 50 meters of resolution. Once completed, this data can be used to design a higher resolution survey site using, using side scan, scan sonar. So right here we have a multi-beam sonar, a 
of a bathymetric image of the Japanese submarine. Can you guys see the submarine? It's a little small. <laughs> and then we have radar. Radar systems are more affordable in comparison to LIDAR sensors. Mm -hmm. However, this might change as many companies are continuing to develop more solid state LIDARs at a lower price range. We have a, a radar scan here, which it's even more difficult to see what we're looking at. However, radar sensors are very robust, they're very durable, and they perform well in bad weather when LIDAR, when LIDAR can often fail. So there are uses for radar, and they do tend to be used complementary with the other aspects of documenting underwater cultural heritage. Then we have side scan sonar. And side scan sonar is a methodology that is used by many maritime archaeologists and scientific re uh, underwater scientific researchers. Side scan sonar is a category of an active sonar system used to detect and image objects on the seafloor. Multiple physical sensors are on the sensor uh, are on the sonar right here. It's called a tran and called a transducer array, and it sends and receives acoustic pulses that help map the seafloor and detect other objects. This array can be mounted on the ship's hull or placed on another platform like a towfish, as we see here. The pulse signals are transmitted from each side of the tow vehicle and reflected from the bottom in objects of the seafloor. The sonar is concentrated in narrow beams on both sides of the tow vehicle. So traditionally, it's a little bit like trolling and fishing. You drop down this beautiful device right here, and you're using a boat, and you tow it behind you. And you continue making a survey, but there's limitations in this. So basically, it shoots out its rays right here on both sides but you won't necessarily get the data that's directly underneath it, which is why it helps to make multiple paths over the same area. So what are the pros of sonar scanning? Well, it's affordable and less expensive to run than for example, a remote operated vehicle, an underwater automated vehicle or any of that, with, which comes with a much higher definition camera. It records screen captures and scans and there's a very high detection rate as well. You're most likely to be able to find a wreck using this style of documentation. Night surveys are also possible. You're not limited by sunshine as it is a vehicle, not a vehicle, I'm sorry, as it is something you were towing behind that shoots out the sound. Scientists are able to efficiently cover a lot of ground and also data can be shared easily because unlike photogrammetry and photography, the amount of data that is created from these documentations, it's much smaller. But as you guys can see in these photos, even though they are all beautiful photos for an archaeologist, they're not exactly very high resolution, right? So these are much smaller amounts of data, which means that it's easier to share with more people and you're not so limited if you have slower internet. So what are the limitations with side scan? In deeper water, Tracking a toad size scan fish is problematic since the acoustic tracking systems are typically limited to a range of approximately three to four kilometers. In about 1500 meters of water, at least five kilometers of cable is required to position the fish at the required depth. So you need a very long cable if you wish to put this baby down deep. And it's limited to line surveys and you have to move the boat at constant speed. So Autopilot's your friend in this situation. Side scan sonar cannot measure bathymetric depth, so it is often used in tandem with depth measuring tools such as single beam and multi beam sonar in order to create a more comprehensive map of the seafloor. Limited to perpendicular um, detection, as I said, the fish itself does not scan directly underneath, it scans what's going off on the side of it. And again, low resolution in screen size. And also, if you're working during the day, and you are the person monitoring the monitor, you do have the environmental factors of sunshine. I know all of you have looked at your phone in the sun and you can't see what's on it, right? You're hiding it, trying to figure out. Now imagine doing that on a boat. This is an actual limitation, especially if you're looking for something small that's being picked up. Glare of the sun is an actual issue for underwater scientists.
So conclusions are digitally documenting underwater cultural heritage and the obstacles of methods. There's a wide variety of technology that can be used to document underwater cultural heritage and each method has its own appropriate use. The most effective documentation methods often use various technologies in tandem to be able to create a comprehensive data set that can be published to the public, used for researchers, and also collected <coughs> and passed around. Publishing photos and videos to raise awareness of underwater cultural heritage on social media does reach more people than a journal. Everybody is so excited they get a publication and I'm excited for them too. But to be honest, a lot of articles don't ever get read. So when you want to engage the public, you can't just say, I have a publication, check it out. There's some marketing. You gotta make it look good. You've gotta make it beautiful. You've gotta catch people's attention. That's why you can have an article that you've published and some beautiful photographs that you can say a very brief synopsis of your research and then provide a link to the more in-depth article so anybody that is interested can learn more. Access to information and presenting information to the public is essential for public engagement. As Jacques Cousteau said, we marvel at what we love and we protect what we love. If we wish to promote the preservation of underwater cultural heritage, we need to reach the public to show them why it's beautiful, why they should care. And this is part of using beautiful photogrammetric models, captivating videos, images, interviews, what's the other one, podcasts, all of this. These are all ways to reach the public that are new for academics, that we're not necessarily the pioneers in. And this is an aspect of research and academia that we're starting to learn more about, is the importance of publishing your research and data in a way that reaches the public and not just other academics, especially if we wish to generate funding or preservation, <coughs> funding for preservation, it's a hard sell if no one knows about it. But if you're able to create a video that goes viral, people will know about it and people will want to preserve it because they might want to go and take a photo there themselves. So it's important that we use a multiple, uh, multi-discipline method with documenting underwater cultural heritage Otherwise, it will just get lost in the Dewey Decimal System of the library. And that's why I believe that blogs, photographs of wrecks, and addressing management issues, and furthermore, speaking with the diving community and the communities themselves to find out what are their needs and their interests is an integral aspect in preservation work. You need to find out what the people want. If you have divers that want to learn more about the thistleborn, you create a dive course that they can learn more about shipwreck preservation. You can create all of this information that is accessible to the public if they want to learn more. If they're interested in the historical aspects of the Thistlegorm, you publish a YouTube video that goes over the history of the site. Basically, you want to make academic research digestible to the public in using photographs, photogrammetry, and videos helps to bring in a wider net of people that might otherwise not be interested in what your little radar shows you. Most people will not look at that image of the submarine and realize it's a submarine. They might think it's a microscope of a germ. Maybe it's corona under there. They don't know. So we need to give this information to people. Data collection is very important to develop and distribute questionnaires about people's knowledge of these sites because I went to a conference in Philadelphia last year, and I found out that this wonderful group of researchers spent $25,000 on a questionnaire. And you know what they found out? For $25,000, they found out most Americans believe archeologists dig up dinosaurs. <laughs> I could have spent $10 and stood outside a Walmart, a Whole Foods, and a Target to get the same exact information. So it's important that we are able to reach the community and interact with the community to understand what they know, what they don't know, and what they're interested in. And in this aspect, we're using a tandem approach of multiple methods to be able to overcome the obstacles in documenting underwater cultural heritage. And for me guys, I see a bright future ahead. With the proper documentation 
and preservation methods to facilitate underwater cultural heritage to be enjoyed by future generations. We all love this stuff, but it's not going to be there forever unless we take the actions to preserve it and to promote its importance in the community. People need to understand why it's interesting. They need to be able to know their own history. And by knowing one's own history, one's own culture, you're able to connect with your identity and have a more holistic understanding of the importance of underwater cultural heritage. Greater awareness will lead to more visitors to the country of Egypt and the financial benefit from high value tourists. Scuba divers are not necessarily your backpackers who are over in the Philippines. These guys are usually middle to upper income, which means when they come to visit Egypt, they're not just going to stay in the $10 hostel that, that snaps. They're going to be staying on a nice boat, in a hotel, someplace that's nice. And that's great, but what's important is to understand the economic impact of these. High value tourists generate jobs. If they want to go out to a nice restaurant, that restaurant has their fishermen that they go to get their food. They have their chefs, they have their waiters. All of this brings in additional economic stimulation into a country. And Egypt is a country where people love to visit. So it's important to be able to understand the types of tourists that are coming and how we can ensure that they not only want to come back again, but that they have a good time here and that they take photographs and they share it because word of mouth is a very powerful tool in the tourist industry. So it's essential that people understand underwater cultural heritage its importance and they're able to enjoy it because their experience might lead to two, three, five, twenty other people coming to Egypt and bringing in their economic stimulation into the country. More engagement with the public and understanding how to effectively reach people will enable greater protection and enjoyment of underwater cultural heritage. And I want to end on a quote here. History is not what happened, but what survives the shipwrecks of judgment and chance. And lastly, I'm going to show you guys two little videos so that we can see a, a holistic approach to how, you, how to reach the public. So first off, we've got the, the Carnatic. Let's see if it plays with music. I can see. Y'all can hear that, right? That's good. Oh, look, we've got our drawing in there. Looks nice. And this video actually won um, the Societal Historical Archaeology Video of the Year Award. So I'm very, I'm very proud of this. So we've got our photogrammetric model. So we have a digital model, photogrammetric model, and Zian commented. Everything's in stuff, color is And right here, what he has in his hand is six or eight GoPros that are all synced together to be able to create a 360 degree tour. This is the Carnatic. It's a beautiful site. And when I make these videos, I want to show people things they, they've never seen. I want them to be able to feel my passion in my work. So when I'm diving these sites, I'm not only looking at the archeological aspect, I'm looking with an artistic eye of what will catch people's attention.
Your next catch line, stay tuned for more. And then we've got this other one, which I will enter next year with the ACUA for the Dunraven. So I put a little bit of information, you know, tell them the shipwreck, when was, it, uh, when was it built, and where did it sink? Where should you go? You guys can see we have our, our tripod here, We're ready to go underwater with it. Yeah, this is, in the, this is off of uh, Sharm El Sheikh. And also this inspires other people to get involved in the field. We look really cool here. I get to do this for work. You know what this means? It shows little girls, little boys, you can do this. And it gives them aspirations, things that they want to do. And when people care, they have a dream, they want to protect this stuff because they want a future to be able to access it too. Now here's Simon Brown doing his photograph. Beautiful ship, beautiful fish. So we're gonna, we're gonna penetrate the ship now. with the artistic creation that you're putting out makes videos even more effective as well. So I want to say thank you guys for everyone who, was, who came. There's my beautiful references. And uh, here's our, our Rex at Risk uh, group of people. So thank you guys all. <laughs>